we are uh, starting with a, a short Bible class that we call Soldiers of Christ, uh, and then uh, we're going to go right into our worship uh, after a brief Bible class. Uh, we're excited that, uh, that Max Azaga uh, was baptized this afternoon. Max, we're really happy for you. Uh, this is a great, uh, great day, and I've been studying uh, with, uh, with Diane and his family, so uh, happy for you, and uh, look forward to many, many great things uh, together. So this has been a great day. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you some questions uh, as, we, uh, as we get into our Soldiers of Christ study, and some of you don't even know what Soldiers of Christ is. We've got some questions. I've got them in a box over here, just some questions on cards. We're trying to go through the New Testament, uh, learn some key facts uh, some key chapters, key locations, those kind of things, just to, just to get some things to stick uh, so that after a while, uh, you know, God's Word is, is, is really just a part of our lives, part of who we are, uh, just kind of a second nature uh, kind of thing. Uh, and so what we've been doing as, uh, this year, since we started, we started back in January, is I've been just trying to highlight what have we learned about Jesus just from the first few chapters uh, of each of the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We, we haven't even made it uh, very far in the life of Jesus, and that's what we're trying to work through uh, in Soldiers of Christ right now. But we haven't made it very far, but I thought, okay, I thought we'd take one Sunday and say, what have we learned about Jesus so far? Well, this is now the third Sunday uh, of that one Sunday uh, that we were just going to do a quick review uh, of what we've learned about Jesus. And so tonight, we're going to finish it. That one Sunday became three, but it is not going to become four. Uh, we will finish just this quick overview. But I, I have found this interesting. I hope you have too. That as, we've, as we have surveyed just the early part of the life of Jesus, we've learned some things about Jesus that I think we need to, we need to have remembered, that we need to have written on our hearts. Uh, and here's 18 things. We've already made it through 13 of them, so we're going to add the last five tonight. But some of you haven't been here, so let me just... Let me very quickly give you these. Who is Jesus? Number one, Jesus is God. We don't need to forget that. We don't need to be told that he is a God or that he's some created being. Jesus is God. Number two, Jesus is eternal. How long has Jesus existed? Forever. He's always been here. Jesus is God. Jesus is eternal. Number three, Jesus is Jehovah. What does that mean? Jesus is the eternal, self-existing one. When God said, I am who I am, guess who else is I am who I am? That's God. That's Jesus. Uh, and so we don't need to think that there's Jehovah and then, and, then God, and then Jesus fits down here somewhere. He's God. He's eternal. He's Jehovah. He's creator. Number four, he's creator. What did Jesus create? Everything. We need to know if... This is a verse you need to know. That's why we put it in here as a key location. Key location. If you're in a discussion with somebody and they don't really realize who Jesus is as creator, what is a verse you can take them to that shows that Jesus created all things? John 1 and verse 3. You don't even have to have the verse memorized, although it's a short verse and you pretty much have it memorized if you know what it says. But there's nothing made that Jesus didn't make. That's a verse that you need to know where it is so you can take it and show it to people. That Jesus isn't just some baby born and laid in a manger. Jesus is the one who created everything. Very quickly, and I told you we're going to get through all of these, and here I go slowing down the review. Number five, Jesus is Emmanuel. What does that, what does em Emmanuel means what? God with us. That's something we need to remember. That when Jesus comes down, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God takes on flesh and dwells in a human body on this earth. Where can I find that? Where can I find a verse that says that God became flesh and dwelt among us? John 1, 14, key verse. One of those verses, you don't have to memorize the whole thing, just know where it is. Numbers, what, number what, seven? Number six, Jesus is the Christ. What's that? He's the Messiah. He's the one that was promised in the Old Testament. How many prophecies were made about the coming Messiah? 332. How many of them did Jesus fulfill? All of them. That makes him the Christ, makes him the Messiah, makes him the prophet, the priest, and the king. Because what does Messiah, what does, what does Messiah mean? It means Christ. Messiah is the Old Testament word for Christ. 
What does Christ mean? The anointed one. He's the prophet, he's the priest, he's the king. All right, number 10. Let's finish these up real quick. Jesus is the Lamb of God. John, John said, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. Those Old Testament lambs that they sacrificed, did it take away the sin? It covered over the sin. It atoned for the sin, but only the blood of Jesus could take it away. Only the blood of Jesus could remove it from the memory of God. Isn't that one of your favorite verses about sin? Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember how long? No more. They're gone. Jesus is the Savior. That's the one we know, perhaps the best. Uh, Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of David. He's the Son of Abraham. He is exactly who the Jews were anticipating. Sometimes when you read, have you, have you seen this? You, have, you've seen this in the book of Matthew already. You're going to see it some more. When, when the Jew, Jesus' critics looked at Jesus, could this be the son of David? Why did they say it? You might use expressions today that aren't very nice that sound like that, but they said, could this be the son of David? Why were they asking that question? Who was the son of David? The Messiah, the promised one. They were looking for him. They were waiting for him. And could this be him? So that's 13 things that basically tell us who Jesus is. The last five are not saying who Jesus is, but are describing who Jesus was and the kind of person that he was. So let's get through these. Let's make some application from these. Number, what is this? Number 14. Jesus was determined to do Caleb, Jesus was determined to do what? Jesus was determined to do right. Where do we learn that? Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. What was, the, what was the reason that Jesus was baptized? To fulfill all righteousness. He said it. John the Baptist, when Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist, what was, his, what was John's immediate response? It was resistance. I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me? He, he tried to resist baptizing Jesus. So Jesus said, no, you need to be baptized. I need baptize. You need to baptize me. Now, what was the purpose of John's baptism? Mark 1 and verse 4. Purpose of John the Baptist's baptism was for the remission of sins. Jesus comes to get baptized. How many sins did he have to be forgiven of? Not a single one. Okay, Jesus, then why do you need to be baptized? Because Jesus was determined to do right. That's what Jesus said, permit it to be so, for thus shall we, we must fulfill all righteousness. Do we need to be determined to do what's right? Now, the purpose of our baptism is that it is for the remission of sins. So we need to be baptized in order to be saved from our sins, but we also need to be baptized because it's the right thing to do. Now, take that and apply it outside of baptism. Do we need to be like Jesus and just be determined to do what's right in every situation? Have you ever heard this? It's always right. Oh, you've heard that before. Where, where have you heard that? It's always right to do right. So how often is it right to do right? So if it's always right to do right, then it's always wrong to do wrong. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. How do you know it's right? Because you were told it by Dan, Eva says. <laughs> of course. Exactly. I know it's right because I was told it by Dan. And since Dan told me, it's got to be right. Just don't listen to him on football stuff, but the rest of the time... This guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Got to be honest, right? Right. <laughs> it's always right to do right. Because I learned from Jesus, I need to be determined always to do whatever God wants me to do. Can I go to heaven if I'm not determined to do what's right? I can't go to heaven. 
if I'm not determined to do what the Bible says, because the Bible is what's right. Number whatever we're on. Number 15, Jesus is worthy of worship. Where do we get that? We don't have any questions on that, I don't think. But in Matthew chapter 2, who comes to see Jesus in Matthew chapter 2? Do you know? Who was it? The wise men. The wise men come to see Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. Three times in Matthew chapter 2, it wasn't always the wise men saying it, but three times there is talk about worshiping Jesus. How old, roughly, generically, uh, how old about was Jesus in Matthew chapter 2? Was he less than 30 years old? Yeah, 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 you can shake your head this way. Was he less than 10 years old? Yep, yep, you can shake. Was he less than 5 years old? All right, we're getting closer. He was 2 years old or less. How do we know that? Because that's what Herod determined from the wise men when they saw the star. He's 2 years old or less. And when he's 2 years old or less, he's worthy of Worship. Really? A little baby? A little toddler? Why is he worthy of worship? Because he's God. Because he's the creator of all things. If he was worthy of worship at two years old, as a baby, what is he worthy of now? Is he worthy of my worship? When I come inside this building... What am I here to do? I'm here to worship. I mean, we, we come here and we visit with each other. There's something that God understood about corporate worship. Wouldn't you be a whole lot more comfortable if you could just wake up on Sunday morning, sit up on the side of your bed, sing a little song, say a little prayer, eat a little bread, drink a little juice, read a little scripture, and then go back to sleep? I just worship God on the side of my bed. Wouldn't that be great? You could do that. You go back to sleep, and the first day of the week has come and gone, and you've worshiped God. Right? That's not what God designed, is it? He designed for us to come together. You think God knows what he's doing? You think God knows that we need each other? Do you think he knows that we need to not only sing to the Lord, but sing to one another? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? So we were singing this morning. Do you listen? Do you listen to everybody else singing too? You need to learn to do that. Uh, when, when I was in chorus in high school, it's what our teacher told us to do. She said, you're trying to, hit the, you're trying to hit the exact right notes. You're trying to think about the words that you're singing. But she said, you need to listen to everybody else in the chorus who's singing around you. Now, she was saying that for a different reason than what God is saying it. God is saying it because we're encouraging each other. When we sing about God, sing about Jesus, sing about the church, we're singing and building each other up when we do that. Jesus is worthy of our worship. Number 16, we've got to get through these. Jesus is more powerful than the devil. Where do, where do you think we learned this? I know it's up there. Where do you think we learned this, that Jesus is more powerful than the devil? In the temptation. Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. Who tempted Jesus three times in the wilderness? Same person who tempts you every single day. You believe this guy is still going? I mean, he's like the perpetual evil energizer bunny, right? He doesn't stop. He's been pounding on that drum since the Garden of Eden and he's still going. We could say nothing outlasts the devil, but that's not true. You outlast him. Jesus outlasts him. Same one who tempted Adam and Eve, same one who tempted Jesus is the same one who tempts us. And so when you're introduced to him in Matthew chapter 4, he is called the tempter. Is that descriptive? What is that? You've got a word that tells you his name is the tempter. What does he do? He's there to get you to 
He's, get, he's there to get you to do wrong. But we learn that Jesus is more powerful than the devil. Let me ask you a question. Are you? Jesus, well, of course Jesus was more powerful than the devil. What did we just learn? 13 things about him. He's God, he's eternal, he's Jehovah. Of course he's more powerful than the devil. Duh, right? I mean, everybody knows that. Are you more powerful than the devil? What did Jesus do? Question number two. What did Jesus do to effectively to respond to the devil every single time? Quoted scripture. By quoting scripture, he defeated the devil. Can you do that? Jesus was more powerful than the devil because he got God's word into his heart. And when you get God's word in your heart, it's there so that you don't sin against God. Are you more powerful than the devil? Don't, don't ever think the devil's more powerful than you. Don't ever think, well, the devil just made me do that. Devil cannot make you do a thing. All right? Your mama might be able to make you do something. All right? She might be able to give you a look. She might be able to send you on a guilt trip with a loaded bag, bag, you know, suitcase and all that stuff on your guilt trip. She might be able to make you do something devil can't make you do anything you've got to say yes you've got to be willing to give in we need to remember that when he comes at us that no matter what happens in our lives we can always say no can he tempt us beyond what we are able to bear can he do that wherever your threshold is for temptation is the devil able to take you above that threshold not <laughs> Jerry's got a good answer. Not if we don't let him. What does God provide for us every time? He's got that way of escape. You ever been driving down the interstate? You see that exit sign? How, how, far, how far back does it usually tell you that exit's coming? I mean, it depends, right? I mean, if, 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 there's, a, if there's a Bucky's at that exit, then there, you're going to be told about 200 miles before you ever get to that exit. There's a Bucky's up there 200 miles. Don't stop anywhere else, right? Um, but when you're coming up to that, I mean, or, or a Cracker Barrel, they'll tell you like 50 miles before you get to a Cracker Barrel. How, off, how far ahead do you know that exit's coming? Well, at least by two miles on those green signs, and then a mile, and then a half a mile, and then sometimes a quarter of a mile. Exit coming, exit, you know it's coming. When you're being tempted, do you know there's an exit? It's right there. Just look for it. And you can avoid, you are more powerful than the devil. Last thing real quick. Number, oh, next, next to last thing. Who does Jesus want to be saved? Every single person. I got to ask myself the question, do I? Do I want everybody to be saved? Last thing, number 18. Jesus treats everybody with love and respect. Where do we learn that? Jesus met Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Do you know what Nicodemus was? As a Jew, do you know what Nicodemus was? He was what? A Pharisee. How many positive, good encounters do you suppose Jesus had with a Pharisee? Hmm, mm, mm, mm. not very, you can't count very many. So when this guy comes to him at night, hmm, you ever have somebody suspicious approach you at night? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, i got to keep an eye on that. How did he treat this man? Love and respect. Love and respect. But you see it especially with the woman at the well. The woman at the well, what, what, where was she from? She was from Samaria. She's from a Samaritan woman. What dealings? What de the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans was what? Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus comes into Samaria. Does he have any dealings with the Samaritans? Yes. Does he have any dealings with a woman of Samaria? Oh, that's like a double whammy. You don't, have, you don't do that. But here he is talking with this woman at the well. Was he treating her with love and respect? Yeah, he was. Did other Jews treat Samaritans, let alone Samaritan women, with love and respect? No. Did not. What did they call them? Dogs. 
that's not very nice. And yet Jesus treated them with love and respect. Very quickly, what in the world? How did 17 and 18 get up there first? All right, 18 things. 18 things just in... If we learn this about Jesus just in the first couple chapters of each of the books of the, of the Gospels, what else are we going to learn about Jesus? Is this going to be compounded even more? Every single one of these. Do you suppose you're going to see nearly every single one of these again throughout the rest of the Gospel accounts where you have this reaffirmed over and over, this is exactly who my Jesus is. He's not some fairy tale. He's not somebody that you just read about in some book that's, that somebody made up in some kind of a fiction book. Real man came and lived a real life, died on a real cross for my real sins so that I could go to a real place called heaven. That ought to change our lives to learn about him.